So we've been talking about uh, music a little bit as we've gone through this series because so many of the songs that you and I listen to, secular songs, are relationship-based. If you take away relationships, there is no country music at all. It's all gone. And most of rock and roll with it. I was trying to think, uh, like the Beach Boys, did they have one song that wasn't about the beach, surfing, or relationships? The only thing I could think of was Be True to Your School, which is a terrible song, but it would be all that's left. And I was thinking about some of the other music that I've listened to over the years. Do you remember when um, it was very in vogue? This is going to date me, but don't really care. Um, do you remember when it was sort of in vogue to assign ringtones to people, songs, in your cell phone? And so various people would call, and you would assign a song to them. And by the song, you knew who it was. This is a true story. Um, well, back when I thought that was really funny, I assigned Joan Jett's I Hate Myself for Loving You to Deborah. And... <laughs> The first time she heard that, I was invited to change that song, <laughs> which I did. And I learned that by myself, I will not stand, but with her is the only chance I've got. Amen. It's so true. <laughs> so we're, we're talking about that. And the basic premise of our scripture, and again, this is a book of wisdom, so it tends to be practical. It, just kind of, it, wa it wants to tell us things that are helpful to us. And it really doesn't make a whole lot of effort to tie them to God, Christ, in any kind of grand theological way. Although that's there, it, really, it, just, it just really wants to talk to us. And, and one of the things in today's scripture it wants to say to us is that by yourself, whoever you are, by yourself, you don't stand a chance. Because if we try to do this life alone, it's just not going to work. And when you have, and we all do, have that Lone Ranger kind of attitude that we think that I can do this all by myself and I don't need anybody to help me and I can find the life I want on my own, there's no way. There's just not. And that doesn't mean that it's God's plan for everybody to be married. I don't think that is. Paul wasn't married. I think that was God's plan for him. Jesus was not married as far as we know. Not God's plan for him. But no matter who we are, we need significant people with us for the very practical reason that life is going to get hard. And when it does, we need folks to lean on and help us up. It just is. I don't care who we are, something nasty is coming at us. As scripture tries to tell us, there will be times where we are in the wilderness. And when you're in the wilderness, you do not want to be alone. And the book of Ecclesiastes, wisdom literature, scripture is just trying to tell us that over and over and over. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up the other. Woe to the one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Why? Because they can't get up. And so if we just understand that we are here for each other, it's so much stronger. Then the scripture goes on to say that even better, if, like, uh, if you have a cord and a rope, if there are three... And in, 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 in wedding ceremonies, we, we preach this text all the time. If there's the husband, if there's the wife, if there is Christ, and they are all wound together, that is so much stronger than the two could ever be alone. So that's our goal, is to have this, this life that is woven in such a way that God runs through it to bring us closer to each other and to make us strong enough to survive whatever comes. How I pray all of us would have relationships like that because you're gonna you're gonna need them two is great three is better and if you think about it life life three is just sort of a magic number in life isn't it I mean if you take something as simple as bread peanut butter and jelly that's awesome isn't it which one would you do without none right because they're all great together. How many of us are going to have PB&J for lunch right now just because I mentioned it? How many of us are hungry right now just thinking of lunch? Think about Astros World Series appearances. 05, 17, 19. God's plan, right? Three. Maybe we'll have three victories, one in 2020, too. 
other ways in which we can kind of think about it. It's just so many times I think that, you know, when people ask me, they say, what do I do to follow Jesus? Or what do I do to have a better life? Or what do I do to have a better marriage? They want to know the one thing. And here's the problem. I know the one thing is Jesus, but how to follow the one thing is tough. And what the one thing is, is going to change. There are going to be times in my relationship where sacrifice is in order. And I'm going to have to give up myself so that there is a greater good that's accomplished. There are times when I'm going to have to rely on the grace and mercy of God. Just throw myself at his feet. Just say, I need that to be one of the cords. There's going to be a time when I need to be, you know, just kind of a, a, a person who receives grace. And so when somebody comes and says, what's the one thing I can do? It, it worries me because life is complicated and sometimes those three things change. What does it take to lose 10 pounds, right? I got to watch what I eat. I got to watch what I drink. And I got to watch what I do. It takes all of those. What does it take to have a great Sunday morning? It's like, I've got to be present. I've got to pray. I've got to immerse myself in scripture. I need to go to Sunday school class. All those things are true. To do one without the other is to sort of live this incomplete version of life. And how many of us are trying to live this, you know, do something more, but we're only doing two thirds of what's required. And I just worry about people who are just trying to find this one solution to things when what God is asking of us is more complicated to that. We are supposed to be merciful, kind, just, compassionate, uh, spirit-filled, holy, righteous, all these things. And when we weave them all together with great relationships behind us, it is then that we become the people God wants us to be. And so to think that just there's one simple thing or one simple answer, I think is a little naive. If somebody would push me and I'd say, following Jesus is always the answer. You want Jesus as the heart of your marriage. But when I think about actually acting that out and living that through, what I weave together is going to change. Because life moves, challenges appear, and all of a sudden we are called to respond in different kind of ways. When Deborah and I had kids in the house, that required one kind of family, right? And we had to make sure that, that there was time for us because there was so much competition from the other little voices. But now that we're empty nesters, things have changed. And so, but other priorities have taken their place. So, I want to give you a couple examples of how I've seen this kind of cord be woven. Because the greatest takeaway I think we can make from the scripture is intentionality in it. And that you and I are called to braid this rope. And we need to braid it with one another and with Christ's good help in order for it to be as strong as we can. But what it's going to take is intentionality in our part and some spirit-filled listening to kind of see what virtues need to be in place at particular times times. I was at Source in the City this Friday night. I went up there, and it was, it was about 6.30, and so things were uh, about to get started, and I'm standing by the elevator here, again, on the sixth floor, and, and um, doors pop open, uh, and out comes this uh, young family in our church, and uh, I met them at their small group. I've been doing a tour of small groups, met them, had a chance to talk, but they have three young children, uh, an itty-bitty and two just barely beyond itty bitty, okay? Now, if you've got three kids, Deborah and I just had two, but if you've got three kids, that's not a family, is it? That's a platoon, isn't it? I mean, when you think what it takes to make that move on time, in coordination, it is a major feat of logistics. If we let parents of families of three or more run the world, we would be so much better off, wouldn't we? I mean, just think about that. We would. We would, because they know how to get it done. But so they come out, and I see them, and I, I look at them, and I, I said, I want you to know that I know what a miracle this is. And they said, what do you mean? I said, you're a family with three kids. You are here at church on Friday night. You're on time. I don't know what you think, but of all the miracles in the Bible, I just saw another one right here. 
And I said, and I laughed about it. And then the, the, the uh, husband actually said, and I don't know if he even thought about what he said. He said, it's important to us. It's a value that we have. We want to be involved in our church, and we want to see our kids see us involved as a family. It matters to us, and that is why we're here. Intentionality. Weave it together. What matters to us as a couple? Faith does. Church does. Christ does. We're going to weave those three things together in such a way that people will see and we will experience the strength of that cord. I think of a parable like Jesus told about the kingdom of God. When you find something that's a valuable, it's like a pearl that's been found or it's been treasured that's been found in a field. You fi- what, when you find that kind of experience, you find that kind of moment, you do everything you can to make sure that you get to that field and that you own it. You see, I think Jesus calls us to be people like that. We, when we see what matters, to Christ and us, and then we make that happen in our lives. Blessings just abound. I was at another uh, meeting this week, a coffee shop. A uh, guy wanted to talk missions in our church, and he and his wife have an 18-month-old uh, kid. And so, you know, we're talking about the holidays. I said, what are you guys going to do uh, for Thanksgiving and Christmas? And he said, last year, he said, last holiday season, the most powerful experience for us was our family serving the lifeline lunch to the homeless. If you don't know us, we do this downtown. Uh, We throw a Thanksgiving day, uh, our Thanksgiving party uh, for members of the homeless community. We invite them into our church, of which they've been many times. And then we, we, we eat. And he said, that was the most powerful experience for us last Thanksgiving, last Christmas. And then he he said this. He said, when it comes to our daughter, and again, she's about 18 months old. When it comes to our daughter, we want her to see us serving this way. Christmas needs not to be about gifts that we give each other. Christmas needs to be about the people that we serve in Christ's name. It's important to my wife and I that our daughter see that. Cords being woven. God working in such a way that they are strengthening their foundation. They're they're bound to each other in an extraordinarily powerful way because of what they're choosing to do. Now my question for you is, what are those cords for you? What are you trying to weave together? And are you doing it? And what that may be for each of us could be slightly different. I have found that at different seasons of life, I need to be more hopeful than I am. I need to be more compassionate than I need to am. I need to be more empathetic than I am. All of a sudden, but you know, when we try to be deliberate about it and weave something new into our lives, what we are doing is exactly what Scripture advises us. Bring this thing together so that it can be stronger. An opportunity wanted to advertise. So a little preaching there. Now church infomercial. And then we'll get back to the preaching. On November the 10th, here downtown, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to have sort of a, a, a ministry fair of sorts. All the ministry teams we have uh, that uh, church folk uh, make happen are going to be on display. And they are going to be recruiting uh, new folks. So whether it's uh, our youth, whether it's our kids, uh, whether it's um, something like our media team, people who run cameras, uh, move switches, all of our volunteer teams at First Methodist need people. They do. So they're going to be here on November the 10th, and right after service, you're going to have a chance uh, to walk through and see who is available. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you are not serving kind of inside the church some way, would you pray between now and November 10th about what that might look like for you? And here's why. You know, when you think about what are the cords that we need to weave together in order to be a powerful disciple for Jesus Christ, I I would say it kind of falls into three camps. There are three things that we need to be about. One, worship. Every seventh day, we are praising God. 
That can be live. You know, when you come to church physically, it can be on the internet. If you interact with us that way, that's fine. If maybe, uh, maybe you're out of town, there are probably Christians where you are. Go find them, worship with them. But every seventh day, the Christian needs to be praising God. And I think it has to be in some way corporate. If you're doing your own thing by yourself, by, you know, on my own, I just remind you of the warning scripture gives us. That person is going to be eventually picked off. So worship every seventh day, sort of one. What else does the powerful Christian need to do? I think they need to serve. It's the ethic of who we are. How do we serve? I think there's two ways. One, inside the church. Help the church be the church. Help the body of Christ be the body of Christ. When you don't serve or if somebody is a member but they're not plugged in, we're incomplete, Paul would say. So what's a way that you could be a part of the church in such a way that you help the church be the church? If you do that, your relationship with your church will change. It really will. It'll become stronger, more vibrant, more powerful. But also your Sunday morning will be a richer experience because I don't think that a Christian can really go through Sunday morning in a powerful way unless they've received, which hopefully worship some of is that, but also served. When those two go together, the Christian is close, I think, to getting it just about right. The third thing I'd say is to say the Christian has to be connected. We need brothers and sisters who know us and love us. And everything changes when you walk into your local church and you see somebody who knows your name and you know theirs. But I would say this. If I see somebody who's a member of First Methodist and I know that they're in worship every seventh day, I know that they serve to help something make inside the house happen, inside the church, as well as serving in missions in some way. I know that when they are connected to a Sunday school class or a small group, what the Holy Spirit has a chance to do through that person is tremendous. That, to me, is somebody who's weaving the cords together so that they can be the most powerful disciple of Jesus Christ that's possible. So if you've got your hands on one of the three, maybe it's time to pick up the other two. If you've got your hands on two of the three, maybe it's time to pick up the last one. But weaving them together in an intentional way, I think is extraordinarily important for all of us. It's like the, the family of young kids. Unless you set an intentional direction you're going to be blown about. But if you pick values that matter to you and God and pursue them, what will happen is you'll weave yourself together to Christ and to each other in an extraordinarily powerful way. I want to add one thing to it. So the infomercial is over. We're back to the preaching now. So I want to tell you the rest of the story. Because again, it's, it's every week. Uh, I start the week by saying, Lord, give me an experience of the scripture. That's because that's I believe Jesus is alive. Uh, I believe the Holy Spirit moves. And uh, it also forces me to look for God in real time. Meaning that uh, sometimes I talk to people who are on the edge of Christianity or the fringe of faith. And, and they just, they, they, don't, uh, they don't believe uh, what the gospel says. And I understand I was that person once too. But if you can experience it, it has a way of persuading us that I think nothing else does. So I told you about going to coffee uh, with uh, the dad and talking about missions and 18-month-old daughter. And we had a conversation. We met at a coffee shop. We talked for about an hour and 15 minutes. And then uh, we got up to go on our way. Uh, I was actually meeting a sprinkler uh, repairman because I have a Methodist yard. It's sprinkled. It's not poured or dunked. And a little bit of theology behind that joke. I'll wait for it. Okay. Um, I had to go meet a sprinkler repairman, and, uh, and then the guy I was meeting with, he had to go on his, his, uh, his way back to work. And um, I'm walking across the parking lot, go about 20 yards, and then all of a sudden I hear somebody yell my name. And so I turn around, and off a ways, I, I see a guy that I don't know, but he obviously knows me, so I, I walk back over and shake his hand, and he's having breakfast, at the coffee shop. And so he introduces himself. He says hello to me. He says, you don't know me. He said, but um, a while back, I started coming uh, to the church. And 
uh, I got the chance to be in worship and listen to the sermon. And he said, my family was going through a really difficult time. And then he, he told me what that was. He said, we were going through, a, we didn't know which way to go. We were, just, we were just, we were reeling, we were hurting, we were lost. He said, but what the church did for us during a few crucial weeks and months was just beyond words important to us. He said, when I saw you here, I just had to ch take the chance to thank you um, for that. And so, you know, because of the privilege of my role, sometimes I'm in a place to receive words that the church deserves. And so I, I told him, I said, you know, it's, it's because of the, the witness that we have. It's because of Christ moving through people. And I'm so glad uh, that, that God worked in your life in such a way to get you all through a trying time in a better place. But then he said this. He said, would you mind if I took a moment to lay hands on you and pray for you? We're outside in the middle of the parking lot in a coffee shop in North Houston. All right? And I'm a prickly person. I don't like to be touched. I don't, you know, I've got a buffer. And it's just, it's, it's sinful buffer, but a buffer nonetheless. This guy is about 6'4". So I'm about 6'2". And, <laughs> and so he just, he just reaches out and he hugs me. I mean, this is full on embrace, okay? And... Uh, you know, and I've had people place their hand on my shoulder, you know, and pray for me. I appreciate that. I've had people hold my hand. This guy is in a full body hug. It's awkward. And he begins to pray. And the first few words I can't even hear because literally I'm thinking, Lord, this is incredibly uncomfortable. I don't know why we're doing this, but I'm going to rock with this for about another 30 seconds and I got to do something. And so, anyway, it goes on and on and on, and he prays for a long time, several minutes. And what happened in me, I'll just confess, is this. I was so reluctant, I mean, just uncomfortable at first, but then, but then it changed. And it just, he's like, do you hear what he's saying? And he prayed for me, and he prayed for the church, and he prayed for my family, and he prayed for my health, and he prayed, he just, I mean, this list of things he just prayed for, all because of gratitude from him. And, you know, and then all of a sudden I had the chance to realize, it's like, do you understand, Andy, this is Jesus talking to me, that I'm trying to work to get people together. And that when you've got one person, one believer, and then a second and the Holy Spirit binds them together, it just has a way of leaving you with a moment where you're very aware of the reality of Christ and all that Jesus is doing to bring our hearts closer to his until the day where they beat as one. And sometimes what that means is that Jesus has got to tell somebody a lot taller than you to give you the biggest hug he's ever given anybody and pray for you, which is what he did for me. I believe the Holy Spirit makes moments happen like that all the time. I was talking to one of our members who wrote uh, a principal of one of the schools in HISD. It happened to be the school she graduated from high school from. A few weeks have gone by since we do that, but just the other day she got a letter back from one of the principals and talked about how meaningful it was that she took the time to open up uh, an avenue of communication and it was very moving to both sides to see God work in each of them. One believer, one believer wrapped by the Holy Spirit, three are stronger than one. I guess the truth that I would say about this scripture is, if it stays on the page for you, its power has been missed. When it's experienced by you, it will change everything. And if that hasn't happened yet, it's very easy to do. Find thread one, find thread two, find thread three, begin to weave them together and then know that Jesus will help you and be involved in this process it's because he wants your heart and his to touch. Pray with me. Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know no matter where you are or how you worship with us, you are always part of our church family. 
We would love to have you join us live downtown at 845 or 11 o'clock, or as always, through the broadcast. We would love to hear from you. If you have a question about today's service, if you would like to contact one of our pastors, if we can pray for you in any way, please reach out to us through our church website. Thanks for worshiping with us today. It was great to have you with us.